Good afternoon, everybody. It's such a pleasure to uh, to get to talk to you today about a subject that uh, I've learned to uh, uh, appreciate more and more, and the opportunities that uh, a basic understanding of uh, your uh, income tax can give you. It's uh, I'm Tom McConnell, program leader of the WVU Extension Small Farm Center, and I've been involved as a farmer and as a farmer educator with taxes for a long, long time. And so we're gonna, this presentation is gonna be some of the getting started stuff. Uh, day after tomorrow, I wanna talk about our relationship with the, uh, the USDA and how we handle some of, there'll be other topics, but I wanna concentrate on the, the USDA and, and those programs. So with that said, we'll just take off. If I can get this to work, okay. Uh -huh. There we are. Can't go. Uh, we can't uh, thank the uh, Northeast uh, Extension Risk Management Education uh, Program enough. They've they've uh, uh, made funds available for us to to do a lot of uh, programming across the state. And you'll be hearing more about that later. But I just personally think that uh, income taxes, when they're understood and managed, can be a real a real plus for you. And so. With that said, this is one of the favorite things. I, I uh, One of the points I wanna make across to you, as farmers, we're the chosen class of taxpayers, no question about it, because we have the option of cash accounting. Now, no other business, no other business has that opportunity. So what we find ourselves then is, uh, and what this presentation is gonna uh, include, are ways that we can exploit that special care that's given to us by being a cash accounting uh, companies as opposed to uh, 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 accrual, which is what everyone else uses. So you can alter your profit or loss by using these tax uh, uh, specific tax expenditures. It'll be more apparent as, as we move on here, but the, uh, your responsibility as a taxpayer, and this is I, this is vital, this is vital. You certainly wanna delay paying taxes as long as you can. You should make it your responsibility to reduce your tax liability whenever you can. And I'm not saying that you should uh, have the tax code memorized because that would be somebody with some very special skills and maybe, anyway, not all that nice to be around, but but we do have lots of tax professionals. And the point that I'm going to make with this is there are lots and lots of ways to fill out a, a, a Schedule F that then transfers over at whatever tax rate you, you pay onto your 1040. But you can be, they can be anatomically correct and not do you a bit of good. So when you're keeping records, paying taxes, please keep in mind that, that the way you respond to these opportunities is up to you and your accountant. But I'm not talking about cheating, I'm talking about working with your professional who would have a very good uh, uh, idea of what you're trying to do and would move from there. But here, we'll start here. Maybe the most important piece of information you're gonna receive from this discussion is simply this, and that is the irs.gov. Boy, back in the day, uh, it was really difficult to, well, I mean, I was I was younger and, and probably didn't focus as much as I should have, but I, I've got lots of fellow farmers that have really suffered trying to get information and figure out what to do. So what they do then is they, uh, they get their information from maybe the wrong source or get their information for someone who's just flat out incorrect or, or who knows what. And so you're living with this, uh, this poor understanding of the tax code. And then, and I will brag on the IRS forever, they put the official Internal Revenue Service website up as irs.gov. And when you do that, I hope everyone follows this recommendation. You do that, and you will see uh, their their uh, uh, login site. You'll notice up in the top right hand corner, I've circled a search. 
And there, uh, in this particular case, I wrote in uh, the farmer's tax guide. You can type in anything and, and that query box is so helpful because you can kind of be thinking about what you need to find out about and write that in there and and then they will uh, they will help you uh, uh, find some of those uh, links and if you don't get exactly what you want you just go back and, and ask again so there's there's of course there's there are lots of forms and then lots of, of uh, subject matter too so in this particular case I chose uh, uh, the farmers tax guide I'm showing you a relic here right now because uh, these don't exist anymore. And that certainly is a yellow 2018 returns. But anyway, the uh, the farmer's tax guide is, uh, you'll see you'll see on the screen that all of these links, are they're all live links. And so you can go, it's searchable. Now, back in the day, when you picked the farmer's tax guide up at the, you know, the post office or the extension office or something there, you just got the, you just got the flat sheet and laid there and you had to search around for it. This is so helpful when you're studying your taxes. And I certainly recommend that you, uh, that you read that and, and, uh, uh, for the points that, uh, that affect you. So publication 225, the searchable farmer's tax guide can be found by going to irs.gov. That is very, very important. So, some of the best advice, uh, I recommend this to everybody, and I know some of you are, are extremely canny when it comes to your taxes and smart and clever and, and all of that stuff. I'm still gonna say, the best advice is to get a great, a great family accountant. And what I think a great family accountant is, somebody that, you gotta appreciate this guy here, I mean, he went out to uh, the farm, that's nice, uh, maybe not wear the suit the next time, but who knows. But anyway, someone that, that takes the time to get to know you, your family, and fully understands what you're trying to accomplish. There is nothing more important than that. There's nothing more important than having a professional in your corner to help you work through uh, all the situations that you're gonna uh, fall into and you don't know what they're going to be. So if your accountant understands, and then, and I'll tell you another word uh, 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 to keep in mind, the, there's 23,000 farms in, in West Virginia. Finding a tax accountant, I'm not slighting anybody, but finding a tax accountant who understands agriculture is a bit of a, a struggle. You've got to work around and, and look for these people, and that's why you wanna to talk to them, and treat them just like, you know, uh, you've got a family doctor, you've got a family attorney, you've got a family uh, accountant or tax preparer. And, and your tax preparer can be every bit of what you need and not be a, a CPA. There's, there's people that are that good and that sincere. Here's the situation. Uh, uh, several years ago, I got into a, a tax meeting and, and uh, I mentioned something about, well, I think it was actually what I'll be talking about next week or next time, but I was talking about uh, uh, equip payments and, and how you report that and what's, what's required. Well, uh, the situation was that uh, the person had gotten an a equip grant to do something on the farm. I, have, I don't remember now. And I said, well, you know, if the right conditions were met, you wouldn't, uh, you'd report that but not pay taxes on it. Well, they got a 1099 from the government the accountant saw that and would have none of it, none of it. So that year, the guy uh, uh, went ahead and paid taxes on a 1099 government thing for an equip uh, loan. And then the next year he came to me and I circled it on the, you know, that was back in the paper uh, uh, farmer's tax guide and circled it and took it home. And then the accountant read it, understood it, researched it more. And then they amended his return. And he, I mean, he uh, reduced his uh, tax liability by, Twenty-five thousand dollars, and I mean that's that's the important of this. You have to you have to provide some leadership to your professional. The other issue here is your accountant that doesn't necessarily have to do this, but you've got to keep uh, records. And I put papers. Okay, I don't care what type of records you keep. I think a lot of people obsess on uh, uh, some electronic version and and miss the whole point of records. Records should provide you, yep, it should provide you the information 
that you need to uh, properly file your income tax. Keep in mind that there's a lot of different ways to file your income tax. They're all correct, but some benefit you and some don't. So by keeping records and then turn them into management records, that is such that is such a plus. And then you'll find yourself uh, being able to to make decisions based on where you are, and then your accountant can keep up with you. And I don't think your accountant's going to care if your records are are uh, paper or electronic or what. He, your accountant would like to have them in a form that uh, he or she can can understand it. So. Uh, Paper records beat no records and electronic, that's fine if that's if that's what you get. But anyway, but uh, being able to work with your professional and uh, being a supportive relationship is is just, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it for your, for your taxes. Because when I look at this, <clears throat> paying your taxes is not uh, like an, an annual thing. Sure, you gotta, you've got to file once a year, but you need to really uh, uh, manage what uh, uh, what you're doing and how that uh, uh, changes your tax liability because uh, the paper will just lay there and you can write anything on it or your or your uh, electronic uh, schedule F. So let's uh, let's start with that, knowing that uh, decent records and a great accountant will make your life a lot more interesting. I just put this in here so farmers think about this a little bit. I'm not going to belabor this point, but uh, uh, if you, even if you, like 95% of us, if you have an off-farm job uh, and you make more than $400 uh, on the farm, uh, you need to pay uh, self-employment tax. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of ways to, uh, to figure that out, but uh, there's links on there. Uh, the income tax uh, income or loss, but you know, as a farmer, even a part-time farmer, whatever you make on the farm is what you pay yourself. And so, uh, although there's a, a desire to uh, sometimes reduce the tax liability, there's also a need to, uh, to have some taxes there and, and uh, consider the importance of having a, having a, uh, 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 social security stream there to uh, to pay into and and longevity on that makes a huge difference so yep you're self-employed and uh, uh so so file accordingly and then of course we you would want to get our 40 quarters in with the social security anyway the numbers can increase you if you're paid social security on your other job uh then this would just add to it so uh so uh let your farm work for you a little bit and uh uh pay your self-employment tax. This is all about getting started. And I, I just feel this is really important that I, that I share this information with you. Uh, every farm, you know, West Virginia is nearly 80% forested and every farm will have a farm woodlot or even more than that. So uh, you hire a veterinarian. Uh, we just talked about hiring your accountant and and your lawyer and, and everybody else, uh, you need to have a professional consulting forester on your team. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a link here on this uh, uh, website, which I mean on the, the, uh, the PowerPoint, which we'll be happy to send anyone that, that requests it to you, but uh, uh, what the consulting forester for, can do for you, there's a million things, but, but one is help you manage your timber site. And, uh, your your site maybe it needs a timber stand improvement and maybe it needs a full uh uh harvest uh just just things like that maybe uh uh when you're when you're actually selling your timber a professional consulting forester a will tell you if what you're doing makes sense uh b he or she i will guarantee it will have you have they will uh uh inspect your timber they'll cruise your timber and fill out a report and say there's x number of thousand board feet and the species are this 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 and this and then instead of having you know good old billy bob come in there and say hey i was in the area and i thought maybe you know if you wanted me to cut your timber i will that is not the way you sell timber 
and uh, your consulting forester will help you uh, uh, cruise and figure out and, and develop a market for that a, a marketing piece for that timber. Then he'll go through and uh, he or she'll go through and find the uh, uh, what else you uh, you know other people that would be interested in that. And the nice thing about all that is uh, I love my trees too. But when I have a professional in there, that professional's relationship with the people actually doing the timbering is way longer and stronger than any relationship I have with them. They're going to protect you during that uh, during that that uh, process. Now, I'm still on your uh, uh, your consulting forester because uh, our counties, our county governments, have a managed timberland program. And to get into that program, uh, it's a minimum of 10 contiguous wooded acres, uh, prepared forest management plan is required, no harvesting activity shall occur until that's done. But what you find is that there's an annual application for that certification. And then that reduces the, uh, uh, the tax liability on your uh, timber stand. So, Personally, I've got a 60-acre uh, piece of timber uh, along the Cheat River in Preston County, and uh, you could barely climb up it. It's so steep, but it, it's, they say it's 60 acres. Well, it was timbered about 15 years ago, which would have been kind of easy to watch. You just cut the trees down and watch them slide down towards the river. But anyway, um, anyway when I went to when I went to pay my taxes I discovered that uh, uh, I was not being claimed for this uh, Kimberly got some noise there it's coming okay so what that meant was my 60 acres of, of timber timber land was I was taxed $945 for that because I did not have the managed timberland. Uh, that that speaks volumes. You as a manager, you as a manager can uh, uh, prevent that. Now, working with your consulting forester, you've got a forest uh, management plan, and you get uh, your tax. Uh, reduced significantly so uh, let's let's work with that uh, uh, that forester and do the managed timberland so here it is the last piece of timber timber information that I wanted to impart here again working with your consulting forester uh, you have an opportunity now there's several scenarios here but if you uh, if if you were left a farm if, if grandpa died and left you this farm then of course the value of the farm uh is is uh placed at, at the value of the farm the day that that grandpa died now but here's the catch and i, I mean there's several people on here but this is the this is where this really is important because if you if you allocate so see that i always do it in nice round numbers so the farm that was left to you and somebody helped you figure this out and said it's worth $100,000. Now, we so, so that value at the time of your grandfather's death locks that farm in at $100,000. That's, your, that's uh, what that farm's worth. Okay, but you know that there's, there's timber on that. And if it's merchantable timber, then, then your grandfather also left you ten thousand dollars of merchantable timber okay so it's yours fair and, and square and you've got the ten thousand dollar basis on the timber not all the timber just the uh just the, that that's ready to sell now and so you can you can reduce your time you can pay your uh you can pay your taxes you don't have to you can refer pay the capital gains on that ten thousand because that's just trading nickels when you when you got the farm so that is important to keep in mind. Now, most of the time, Grandpa died 10 years ago, and you've got the, the timber. Here's where we get our, our, our consulting forester involved. 
that forester then, they call it growing timber backwards, and they will ascertain the value of the merchantable timber, say 10 years ago. And then, then it, there's, some, there's some computations and things, you know, percentages of this and that, but what that will do is save you, will save you uh, paying uh, uh, capital gains on timber that was already yours 10 years ago. Now, uh, what that allows you uh, to do then is, uh, you know, you, this is, the, the significance of this is, whether you got it a year ago, 10 years ago, and you grew the timber backwards or whatever the, the case may be, that is the price. And so if, if it was 10 years ago and the timber was worth $10,000, and you're harvesting, you're harvesting 10 years after that, you cannot uh, claim any of the, 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 the value that the timber's put on. All the growth in the 10 years since you put a value on it, you'll pay taxes for. And that's, that's the whole business trying growing the timber backwards. You'll see what that percentage is, and it can save you thousands of dollars sometimes. So uh, the long and the short of it is, we really wanna have a consulting forester, and we wanna give some thought to this stuff. And uh, it's uh, that that can that can that can change your income considerably. Oh, one other thing about timber: uh, if you're cutting a little bit of firewood or uh, uh, to sell, or cut a few logs, you know a lot of people do that to you know buy some equipment or that sort of thing. You have a couple options. I mean, uh, the cheapest option is to put the uh, uh, put the the timber uh, sale and with capital gains because the uh, the tax rate is, is cheaper. But if you're just working along through that, you can, uh, and you're cutting a few logs, you can report all the, uh, you can report all of the labor you have in that timber and charge that against it and just file it on your, on your Schedule F. But those are smaller operations rather than big ones. Farm use valuation. Uh, this is, this is the same this is the same story as the, the uh, timber uh, improvement uh, uh, certification. This has a big deal, but uh, you can, by filling out your farm use valuation, uh, at, it is due in the courthouse by September 1 each year. The significant is what I just underlined there, the reduction in your taxes is based on the farm rental value of the land instead of its fair market value. The fair market value is what they got me with with the timber. And uh, uh, and so that cost me a lot. Your farm uh, rental uh, value really reduces your taxes. And it's quite an incentive for your neighbors to, to let you use their property because you can file the, the farm use valuation for them and uh, they get their taxes reduced. So I have a lot of, you know, I farm in the edge of a town, and so there's a little farm here, and a little piece of hay there, and this and that, and, and I use that to my advantage all the time. Farm use valuation, maybe everybody in this uh, audience is doing that, but I just really, uh, uh, I, I just hope that all of you take advantage of that. And, and uh, oh, I don't know, I've grown a long time with my uh, courthouse in Preston County, and I'm finally doing that just the way they want it, but uh, it's a whole lot easier to do your farm use valuation paperwork two weeks before the deadline than coming in the last day of August because people get a little, they get a little nervous about those things. But your farm use valuation, the key is it's based on the farm rental value, not the fair market value. And that will pay huge for you. So back to the IRS.gov, uh, I put that in there because uh, that's where you would ask yourself, uh, well, what about uh, deductions and, and allowable expenses and, and this sorts of things? Well, on a farm, there are differences. There's allowable expenses, which will allow, which will allow your farm, if your allowable expenses exceed your, exceed your income, allowable expenses will let your operation show a loss. All right, so if we're in that situation, then we want to think about what we can do. The good old IRS uh, comes through again, and uh, they they uh, uh, have divided this stuff out, which I, there, there's two or three points that, that come here, but as long as we get the difference between allowable expenses and deductions, 
allowable expenses are wire feed, seed, fence posts, and so much more. Okay, so a deduction is like a 179. You can your deductions can come out of your can come out of your taxes uh, as long as uh, there's money there to take it out. So you, with the 179, sometimes you'll have a uh, you'll show your profit, and then you'll have a uh, 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 loss there that you could almost zero that loss out and still have money left over. But this is important as we as we step into this. So if indeed uh, if if wire feed fence posts labor and that sort of thing are allowable expenses, then your employees your, what you pay employees is also an allowable expense. Now, the favorite employee I can think of on the farm and uh, is the spouse. Every, every farm uh, operator that's married has uh, a support from, that, from that, uh, the other side of that couple. Well, the spouse employment uh, thing is very uh, simple. You can, uh, you can hire you know, his or her uh, spouse. Now, if, if there's a partnership and some, some husbands and wives have a farm partnership, this doesn't work there. But for spousal employment, uh, it would allow that spouse and allow the farm to pay that spouse. That would cut down on the farm uh, income, profit. And then what does the he or she uh, cares to do with the uh, health and you know with the uh, incomes up to them but some people could use it for health insurance vacation college fund whatever that is so spousal employment's a big deal it's it's really uh it's a big deal so here's where it gets fun though and you, <laughs> so labor's an liable expense uh if your spouse works with you on the farm you know you can uh, uh expense that off now, to make it a little more complicated and certainly more fun, there has to be a job description. Now, can you imagine uh, we fill out a job description, and in my case, it will be, honey, uh, uh, here it is. Uh, I'm going to be in, I'm going to be in charge, and you're going to be my employee. And oh, by the way, um, you know, I'm going to do something in town this afternoon. If you wouldn't mind coming in and uh, Ted the hay, and if it's dry enough, rake the hay, and oh yeah, and hey, boy something good for dinner and anyway so kind of gets a little complicated that way but the point is there is an opportunity there's an opportunity there to pay that spouse and you got to pay social security and there's nothing wrong with that but there is an opportunity to, to use that option for your benefit on the farm and that's uh that's uh really important so this also includes your kids working on the farm too so you can pay your kids for working with you and you could also kill two birds with one stone and pay your uh, uh, kids with their school clothes that is that is an accepted uh, uh, fact of spousal employment and something we all need to we all need to think about to think that we could deduct the uh, the cost of our kids school clothes from the farm so it's another way that our taxes can help us with that so remember we talked about uh the the beauty of, of being allowed to do cash accounting. Okay, so that gives us, since the books lay open until December 31st, whatever you can do to change your tax uh, situation, whatever you can do then, is uh, uh, it, it's, it's important that you, you look at that. Well, you wanna reduce your tax liability. That's, that's what we want to do. So, Prepaid expenses allows you to deduct half of the feed or fertilizer expenses of the year before. If you spent forty thousand dollars on feed and fertilizer, you can, uh, you know, spend twenty thousand this year and uh, to be used next year. You can't just give the uh, farm supply a a check and say, "Hey, here we are, and this is great." You have to actually buy something. Now, the beauty of this is that uh, when you when you buy uh, this and you in the market, say December 1st, there's a lot of farm supplies that would like to seriously reduce their inventory. And I'm just speaking strictly what's on the books, not where the fertilizer feed sits. It's just they want to reduce their inventory and they can offer you a better price. And again, I want to uh, emphasize the fact 
that delivery is not necessary. So uh, this is this is something that's, I mean, seed, fertilizer, all these things, and, and they can keep the inventory for you. That's no problem. You just need to have an invoice from them that, that says you, you paid for this. I mean, you can reduce your, you can re reduce your tax liability considerably by increasing your prepaid expenses by 50% uh, uh, from the year before. And that, you know, that is another way that we can make uh, uh, the cash accounting work for us. And one of the most interesting things, and this worries people probably more than it should, but the Hobby Loss uh, Farming Act, it's a section 183 of the, of the IRS code. Uh, the IRS is all over. Hey, show all the loss you want to get. You're allowed to take a loss on your operation as long as you show a profit for, for all farms except horses, three of five years, and horse operations, two of seven years. Now, uh, all that means is if you fall out, if you fall out of that, uh, those, those years, and you're now showing a profit one out of five years or whatever that is, all that means is the IRS just switches the responsibility. And if you're in, if you're in the three to five years, they, they just take whatever is written down. If you're not in that, that uh, window, then you have to find that, uh, uh, you have to begin to think about uh, why is it that I'm not showing this profit. Now, I'm going to talk about this nine-point test, but it's really important to keep in mind here and listen about these things. You know, there, the IRS is always a test. There's always, you know, three rules and a test and all this. But anyway, this helps me uh, and you understand how this, uh, how this decision is made. First of all, uh, one of the points is that it's the taxpayer's income status has a lot to do with this. And I'll give you a good example. And the first time I heard this, I called the 40-year veteran of the Internal Revenue Service confused. But uh, the deal is she was working out of the Richmond office. At, uh, Richmond is the, the office of West Virginia and Virginia. And they give the, the examiners, uh, they give them uh, problems to work on. And so she, uh, her problem was, uh, I want you to examine the returns of folks that had a $200,000 uh, uh, gross income, average gross income, and had a $100,000 plus loss on the farm. Now, those are pretty high numbers. And she came back and there were over 220 returns in West Virginia that fit that description. Now, so they followed one, and uh, he was a he was a very wealthy guy. I won't pick on his income or, or on his vocation, but he and his family wanted to have a horse operation, his daughter especially. So he bought his daughter a horse. And well, if you're going to have a horse, then you've got to have a, a barn. And if you're going to have a barn, you have to have a farm. Well, and if you're well off and you have a farm, you might want to pay somebody to uh, to mow it and keep the fences looking good and all that kind of stuff. So what they uh, what they found was he and his 220 close personal friends, this guy, this guy had one hundred and twenty five thousand dollar a year loss. Well, sure, he had a hired man and all this other kind of stuff and turned that in on his on his taxes, uh, you know, his schedule F loss of. Uh, $125,000 slid it over his 1040. And the only catch was that that horse business they were starting was probably doomed when you get right down to it because uh, the horse was a gelding. And so they'd be making no uh, coach or anything there. So you see that taxpayer income status and what they're doing at the farm is pretty obvious to me that someone was trying to, uh, uh, you know, just bury some, some tax money. So the question comes to, should you be audited? Uh, Another one of my IRS buddies goes, I, I, I'm not going to, the IRS is not going to pick on small farmers. And in West Virginia, most all of our farmers are small farmers. But so the point is, is to do the best you, you can. And so this nine point test, and this is what you need to think about, because we're talking about getting started with your, with your uh, farming business. Is your business run 
you know, just is it business like management? So I answer with that is, do you have a do you have a mission statement? Do you, has has a family vision and a family vision of what they want the farm to be? And then is there a management plan from that? And knowing that management plans change almost daily, certainly annually, but you have a you have a set of goals that you're wanting to uh, to achieve. And then the next one is, is there expertise to run a farm? Well, now that's a little bit you want to think about this some because you can be a very successful farmer and uh, have great business skills and maybe not so much agricultural skills. So you just want to keep things like that in mind. What kind of time and effort do you put into to this? Well, as my buddy's uh, theory was, he said, you know, when he gets, uh, uh, he'd leave, he, he worked in the Bridgeport office and he would say, uh, you know, about uh, five after five, I'm in the car and I've got my tie off. And before I get home, I've got my shoes off, my shirt's off. And he said, if I play it just right, I can be on the golf course 30 minutes from when I leave the, uh, when I leave the office. He said, and then my farmer friends, they get home and they put on their coveralls, they put on their boots and they go to the barn or whatever it is. And he said, that is time and effort. So, you know, uh, we need to take, uh, you know, be proud of that. Then the expectations, you know, are, are you working on showing losses now, thinking that uh, how you build that asset will will benefit you? Have you been successful in, in other endeavors? There was a court uh, case oh, 30 years ago, a guy, it had been a long time because he and his wife managed a Western auto store and were quite successful with that. They went to the farm and they turned in huge losses and uh, they didn't keep very good records. They just had, uh, they just had, uh, you know, canceled checks and that was it. And uh, the IRS tax court uh, ruled in favor of him because of his success in other endeavors. They knew that, that he knew, had enough uh, uh, idea of what was going on in the farm to, uh, to make it, uh, uh, successful like his other businesses. Have you had history doing other things over the years? Uh, and it's a relative amount of profit and loss. We get into this sometimes, and a lot of operations will show a cash profit, but then when you add in your uh, depreciation schedule, then it, it shows a, a loss then. And that's just, uh, that is, I'm not saying yes or no, I'm just saying that that is a, a difference that you you sometimes uh, find there. So the relative amount of profit and losses is, is when personally uh, we had a we had a real unfortunate situation with our feeder calves this past year, and you know they were sold and the guy didn't pick them up and then they were still sold and still not picked up and we got to the first of the year and uh, the calves weren't sold so uh, we didn't get a check for the calves until you know about three months into the new year. So now I'm into a situation now where personally I'm going to, I, you know, this, this past tax year, I didn't have, uh, I, I didn't have income. So I'm going to show a larger loss. And then the next year I'm in essence selling two, uh, I'm going to sell two sets of calves. And so they're going to get it all back. And I asked my accountant, I said, you know, is this going to raise a flag? He said, you're not making it up, are you? He said, no, the guy didn't pick the calves up. He said, well, I'd just go right on with it. And, and that, you know, it's just, it's just real life that we're into. So, and the last thing that you want to keep in mind on your hobby loss, because just don't assume because your business is small or you're just starting or any of that kind of stuff that you're just playing around because there's no time to play much on a farm. And so take your, uh, your farming enterprise seriously. And if it's a half an acre of vegetables to take the farmer's market, you'll, you'll take that seriously too. And that's all farm income. Your B income is farm income too, for that matter. And then the last thing is just your personal motives. I mean, uh, it's just, do you want, you can enjoy, you can enjoy farming and not feel like it's a hobby loss is what I'm saying. And uh, most of us, if we had a farm, we'd rather make money than not make money. And I think that's probably enough said there. So these are some of the things that I wanted to uh, to run through on beginning, and uh, I left some time here for uh, for questions. So if anyone wants to uh, ask a question, this is a good time. Lisa's listening. Make sure I don't not hear you. So any uh, questions of uh, of any type? Oh, come on, Jeremy. You can ask a question.
Well, folks, uh, just a little quicker than I thought. I thought there might be a few questions, and I hated to run over. These things are really touchy that way. I can't thank you enough for your particip or for your listening on and, and participating in this. And uh, we're going to uh, really get after a lot of the uh, the money that changes hands with federal programs and, and that sort of thing on, on Thursday. And uh, we'll go from there. And if that's uh, if that's it, no questions or email me. You've got my email. And if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, Lisa and I can get that to you. So I uh, thank you so much. And I guess I'm going to sign off then. This conference will now be recorded. Oh.